Okay, so uh, I'm going to go over the, the preliminary 2021 outlook. Uh, I've, we've circulated a draft PDF with more details than the tables that I'm going to show in the presentation uh, with detailed comments provided by the biologists across the re region for the stocks or um, that they're responsible for. Uh, Sue provided uh, the context about where we're at for conditions affecting 2021 returns um, in terms of the brood years, the smoke conditions, the freshwater conditions and ocean conditions. So that's great. Uh, you know, she points to the need and, and which was seconded by some of the people on the call for longer term planning, not just short term planning. So from that point of view, the outlook is kind of a you know, more traditionally focused on the short term need to inform 2021 harvest planning. Uh, but, uh, you know, ultimately we need to consider the broader management context in, in um, salmon plants. And by that, I mean, you know, moving towards uh, more integrated plans, which some of you were suggesting uh, more ecosystem based plans, essentially, that don't just take into account, uh, you know, the harvest uh, um, management of harvest, but also the management of the you know broader ecosystem um, impacts. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's kind of, um, I second that context, but I'm, we've been making some changes to the outlook. And so I'm going to spend a bit of time, uh, talking about why we're doing that. And it, it, it's somewhat related to, uh, that context as well. So it's just down. Okay. So the outline of this presentation, uh, I'll just review the purpose of the outlook, uh, quickly go over some of the revisions that we've been making over the last year. Uh, biological and management references in relation, relation to the outlook uh, categorical um, categories. Uh, I'll go over the outlook cate categories, uh, uh, brief note on contributors, uh, which there are many, uh, then I'll go over the outlook tables and some next steps that we're working on to improve this document. And not only the document, but the accessibility of the information that's behind uh, um, this, this document. Okay, so the purpose of the outlook um, has it has been since it was first uh, created probably almost 20 years ago or more was to to provide a, a snapshot of expected abundance for salmon in the upcoming year to inform the harvest planning process. Jeff already went over that. The preliminary outlook is categorical abundance and it uh, um, and it's based upon expert opinion. And as you know, uh, for many of the stocks management units, or in some cases, specific conservation units, biologists will be working across the region to create the statistical forecasts and report those, you know, over the next six to, you know, 12 weeks, depending on the, on, you know, the process and, and um, how long it takes. So you, for, for the more data driven populations, you'll, you'll get the forecast as usual. And we'll update this document in early April and replace outlooks um, with forecasts so they're compiled in one place uh, in, um, in the second uh, draft of the, or second version of this. Uh, and so, so you'll have all that information in one place. In the past, it's been difficult to access that. Uh, okay, so we made changes uh, in the outlook over the last year. We're still working on them. It's a work in progress. Uh, a lot of these changes are in relation to uh, where we need to go uh, for changes that have been made to the Fishery Act. So we've aligned the CU groupings or uh, with stock management units. Um, and so, to, so it's to better inform decision making with with the revised Fishery Act changes and IFMP requirements. So prior to last year, there were outlook. Uh, Outlook units, but you know they were they were really just in relation to this document. They weren't that relevant to any other context. And under the Fishery Act, uh, we are required to define major stock management units, and there are specific regulatory requirements about stock references and so on that will need to be associated with those stock management units over time. Uh, some of you may be aware that we're batching them into regulation because, as you will see, there's a lot of work uh, required to get us up to the regulatory requirement under the new Fishery Act. So I've already gone over the second bullet. Uh, we've been trying to uh, provide more standardization of interpretation of, of the stock management unit status in relation to outlook categories. Uh, you know, maybe succeeded. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure we've fully succeeded in this account. Uh, and I'll go over that in a bit too. We've removed language regarding the fishery consequences. Uh, initially in the outlook category tables, they were there, but as you know, uh, in some cases, you know, even, uh, uh, you know, the fishery, response is going to depend on the harvest strategy, harvest strategy and other management objectives that are in place for that stock management unit or CU. 
So, and, and the other piece of this is, uh, strictly speaking, this is a science document and it's not up to science to determine removal rates. Science will help inform that uh, discussion, but th there's other there's other sort of objectives that that get considered in those in those uh, decisions. We've added, we want, want to, um, and I'll go over this a bit at the end of the presentation, add information on, on stock management unit stock trajectories and biological benchmarks and management references where they're defined for additional context and consistency. And overall, we're hoping these changes will result in a document that provides more useful and relevant in information to inform decision making. And obviously we're trying to uh, advance objectives around transparency and so on as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over some of the definitions that you'll see. Uh, so. For salmon, uh, we've got a working de definition of a stock management unit under the, uh, which we're applying under the Fishery Act. So it's a group of one or more conservation units that are managed together with the objective of, of achieving a joint status. So meaning harvest control rules would apply to the aggregate, and they write at least in a core sense. So we started, when we defined the SMUs, we started at a course level with, with uh, what some of you may be familiar with, with Pacific Salmon Treaty Management Units because that made sense because we have to provide information at that scale for that process. It's important to note that the use of stock management units in this way does not preclude considerations or preclude considerations related to conserving CU level diversity, but rather it's a practical aggregation of conservation units for harvest planning and reporting purposes. So it's a scale at which harvest management plans or better management and assessment procedures are developed in integrated fishery management plans. And as many of you know, there's many cases where elements of the precautionary approach are implemented at finer scales of organization with an SMU. So and that happens in different ways. In some cases, we, do, we have specific management plans for conservation units on their own. In other cases, we may um, de-aggregate stock management units within specific areas and inlets and so on. So um, I'll go over some of the references, work we're doing around reference points in relation to stock management units. And a big consideration we have right now is how do we, how do we accommodate for the biodiversity objectives under the wild salmon policy? So uh, the purpose of a stock forecast or outlook is to provide information to harvest managers to potentially adjust harvest plans according to the expected stock abundance. So ideally, in this regard. And as you know, we don't have these in place for many of our stocks, but the status of the stock management unit or subunit could be a CU, could be another subunit, is assessed against specified limits and targets. And in this predefined harvest strategies or harvest control rules are in place that define the actions required to meet targets and avoid limits. So this has been, you know, in our policy guidance or policy documents for many years. It, it was introduced for salmon in the wild salmon policy. You would be familiar with biological benchmarks and upper benchmarks and lower benchmarks and so on. Uh, the difference with the uh, uh, Fishery Act is that, as I mentioned before, we are required at the stock management unit now to have these references. And really what it's doing is, is, is um, bringing DFO up to the state of fishery science worldwide. This is the practice that you'll see recommended by um, you know, international groups and applied in other jurisdictions. So where biological benchmarks and limit reference points are defined for CUs or SMUs, uh, I've, I've, we've tried to compile them into the outlook and forecast tables below. Uh, and if ma management targets are in place, we've identified them. I should note that in because this is a work in progress and, and we're still working out uh, methodologies in some cases and standards, uh, some of these would be perhaps considered provisional, uh, but it, whenever you're defining benchmarks or reference places, reference points, uh, one point is it's, it's much better to have something in place than nothing in place, even if you may be adapting it and changing it over the next you know, few years as you learn more. Lack of references is a gap and work is ongoing to develop the methods and complete the analysis to find these references. So, so uh, most people would be familiar with this type diagram for for um, from the wild sound policy where you know like as I said it's been in place for uh, well since 2004 and the objective was to uh, define benchmarks for status assessments of conservation units uh, you should note that there's nothing in here about um, you know what your harvest intervention is but the implication obviously was that you would you know be the extent of management intervention, intervention, as it says here, um, increases as you're in the red zone. But in the wild sand policy, this management intervention wasn't necessarily intended to just be harvest intervention. It could be other types of intervention. 
around things like perhaps your enhancement program or what you're doing with your habitat and um, restoration programs. Maybe there's part of, you know, predation, um, predator control, whatever. It, it's the idea of, um, you know, we've got, a, we've assessed a, a CU in the red zone. Uh, you know, we need to deal with it through our broader management. In the general sense for DFO's precautionary approach for harvest management, there's a similar type of framework. Uh, I, I, this would be applied at the stock management unit level. Uh, the different one difference between this framework and this framework is that it, it provides some commentary around it's, it's more focused on the harvest implications. And so the idea being that as you approach a critical zone or red zone, the, you would be ramping down your harvest rate. So, and, and of course, it may not look like this, the harvest control rule, it, it could be stepped, it could be, you know, there's different variations of, and you, that you should be familiar with that when we're in a cautious zone, we take different strategies. But, and this, this level here would be like your maximum um, allowable harvest rate. So an example that I'm familiar with and worked with over the years would be something like the SOMAS sockeye system, where at abundant levels, when we're above kind of a, the stock target reference place, we'll allow up to 70% exploitation rate. When we're down below our, our lower operational control points and lower references, we ramp the harvest down to actually, um, you know, zero um, when, when we're down at limit reference points or by, at the lower biological benchmarks. Um, and in between, we have kind of stepped um, approaches. And this is basically a trade-off zone where you're, you know, you're not at target, you're not necessarily in the critical zone, but you're allowing potentially some access to meet other management objectives. Could be community fish, you know, could be providing some stability for fisheries and so on. And obviously that's important, you know, sorting this out um, is important to uh, harvesters. Okay, so this is a work in progress. There's a lot of conversation around how to deal with this. But I think uh, I worked on this actually last night because I think this is basically the way things are shaping under under the Fishery Act revisions, although the policy and guidance around how we apply this framework and what the roles and responsibilities are are changing. But, you know, like I said, the idea is to, you know, the, or the requirement eventually will we have these references in, in regulation. Uh, there's a secondary requirement around, you know, when, you know, at what point when you're in the critical zone that you will have to have a rebuilding plan in place. And one of the arguments that we're making for salmon, which some of you have already made in the call is that, and Jeff referred to, is that that rebuilding plan would not simply be just some, about your harvest response. We need to take a much broader ecosystem based approach or H8 hatchery habitat, um, you know, approach in addition and an ecosystem approach in addition to uh, just simply looking at harvest responses, uh, particularly when you know you've got ecosystem impacts that are significant and Sue pointed out quite a few in her presentation. So uh, yeah, probably we'll have some more discussion about this, but I think this is basically where you would how you would interpret outlook categories. Uh, so uh, an outlook category one under the wild salmon policy would refer to a stock that's in the red zone or below its bio biological benchmark. Under the generalized kind of precautionary approach for DFO, it's below its limit reference point. If you have a more data limited CU or SMU where you haven't defined your references and you're, you know, you're using um, more sort of the expert judgment in relation to observations, it would be well below average. Uh, a two would be you're in that cautious zone, so you're above your biological benchmark or your lower reference point, but you're below your upper, this should be upper BB, upper biological benchmark or your upper stock reference. So you're still, you're below average still, you're in, the, you're in that kind of amber or cautious zone uh, it, or the trade-off in terms of um, harvest potentially. If it's a three, you're near average, uh, so you're above your upper biological benchmark or stock reference point. Uh, if you don't have those defined, this is you're in your sort of 40th to 60th percentile, and then so on. A four would be in the green zone. So if we go back here, this would be like a one, two, three would be kind of in this range, four would be up here. Uh, and then I added a category for data deficient, where, where you know the biologists feel that there's insufficient information to even provide an expert categorical outlook status. So these are usually systems for which there's no monitoring program in place or it's being discontinued. And in some cases, it may be where there's additional work that's, that needs to be done with, with uh, data that may be available. Um, generally, these, these 
these stock management units will show up uh, in places where there isn't a lot of intensive harvest management. But obviously, in the context of ecosystem management and local needs, you know, this isn't going to meet everybody's needs. And, and an example would be that the, the landslide that happened a couple of weeks ago that we already talked about briefly in Sue's presentation uh, in the Southgate River. Um, that is a river that's essentially data deficient. So we know that there's salmon in that river, but but um, and, and you know, it's but it, it's not uh, it's not monitored routinely. So that's, you know, those are some of these will be issues for people. And part of what we're trying to do through this document is to identify gaps, not only in terms of where we're where we don't have elements of the precautionary approach in place where we need it, but also where we've got some data deficiency that we you know maybe want to remedy. And, and I should say that remedying that data deficiency isn't necessarily just through DFO programs. There's a lot of opportunity to work with partners and First Nations and so on to collect information. OK, so the Outlook doc document reflects the contribution and work of many stock assessment biologists across the region. In the document that I circulated, the PDF document, I've got a placeholder there. I'm going to put a table in uh, for each stock management unit with a subject matter expert or, or program biologist there. I uh, didn't have a chance to get to it yet. I was still getting data coming in last after yesterday afternoon. But I'll add that in, in, a, in a final preliminary document that I hope to circulate uh, shortly maybe the next couple of weeks. Uh, but much of the data and information used to create outlook status assessments and forecasts is generated through collaborative programs involving First Nations and other stakeholders and stewardship groups. So I want to acknowledge that that monitoring salmon isn't just a DFO endeavor. We do it, as you know, in partnership um, with all of you, include, you know, and that, that's not just spawning ground surveys and includes partnerships and, and collaboration and catch monitoring and so on. So just a note here too, while many people contributed, this is a bit of a work in progress. You'll notice in the draft that I've got, I, I need to make some changes, I've highlighted them. Um, so I take responsibility for the errors and, and emissions. So let me jump in. I'm just gonna go over the tables. Uh, I'm. You can follow along if you have access to the PDF where there's comments. But one, the other thing that we've done with the Outlook is we've grouped it more geographically. So uh, the old Outlook document kind of used to group it by species and Outlook number. Here, I've, I've to make it more convenient for people uh, and, and for the areas, um, uh, grouped it geographically and broken it down by species in some cases, like the Fraser River. So I'll go, these, I'll go through these pretty quick uh, and encourage you to read the comments. Uh, but you'll notice here, we'll start with from north to south, and I've, I've aggregated Yukon, Chinook, Coho, and Chum. They're all managed under the Pacific Salmon Treaty, uh, given the Yukon River, they, uh, which goes through Alaska, as you know. So uh, Canada's at the end of the gauntlet, and they strive to have escapement target management. So they have an MSY target in place where there's sufficient data, and the, they, they uh, do not permit fisheries when the um, the expected abundance is below the, the lower end of this management target. And so for Yukon Chinook and the Canadian groups uh, focus on the porcupine aggregate. Uh, and oh, I should note too here, as we work through this, where I've got information about CUs, I'll provide it. And that's deliberate because again, I'm, you know, we need to accommodate CU level biodiversity in our thinking about uh, management and harvest management. So in some cases, we will not have sufficient information to break down the CU level information, but I am trying to note through this document uh, what the situation is in terms of how many CUs contribute to an aggregate and so on. So uh, just you can see the outlooks here where the, we've got a data deficient situation with por the porcupine coho CU. Other than that, we're, we've got a pretty low outlook. Uh, Chum was Yukon Chum was particularly low last year, and which is notable. Um, so, so uh, pretty um, low expectations across the board for the Yukon. I'm going to move to the the Elsec River in the transboundary area. Uh, you know, the again low with the exception of Elsec Chinook, which is a average near average return. So it, remember, two is representing a below average return. Uh, um, so. So low to average for the LSEC system, all species. The Sakeen system, uh, we've got, in this case, we've actually got the forecast completed for, I don't have the air around here, but for Stikine Chinook, uh, you've got a, this, this translates into 
relative to the management target, they're below uh, their management target. So under the harvest rule that they have for Sakine Chinook, you wouldn't expect uh, no fisheries unless in-season in information uh, suggests that they're, they exceed the 14,000 lower um, bounds of the escapement target. Sakine sockeye is a two. So again, fairly low expectations here. If we move down to the Taku River a little bit, um, a little bit more optimistic with the exception of Taku Chinook, which is below its uh, management target range as well. And we've got a data deficient system with Taku Chum. So there's the transboundary area. I'm gonna move to, we've grouped into Haida Gwaii here. Again, Haida Gwaii is mostly data deficient. Uh, here that just, oh, in, the, in terms of the pink odds, most it's mostly an even year run, so that's why we've got a not applicable here. Um, a little bit of information for Haida Gwaii, Sakai, but again, expected to be low. Uh, the, in part of the project here in, in, in breaking down each stock management unit, noting, noting where there's conservation or subunits, and even if it's data deficient, putting placeholders in there for the reasons I mentioned above. And these are opportunities that we might want to identify for improving um, this situation. So moving to the Skeena, uh, so I've got it broken down by NAST and then Skeena Sakai. Uh, again, we've got low expectations for both the NASC and, and uh, Skeena Sakai, popu Sakai populations with perhaps a little bit of optimism for some of the CUs that contribute to the Skeena wild aggregate, but mostly low expectations and similarly low expectations, one to two to twos for um, NAS and Skeena pink. Again, uh, take a look at the comments in the document I I've, I've um, provided if you wanna look at uh, the, the rationale from the biologist who provided the uh, um, the expert driven category here. Uh, moving to Nash Chinook, uh, again, a low expectation. Uh, Sue mentioned that a lot of Chinook populations, and we noted in the in the even in the Yukon and transboundary areas, a lot of Chinook populations have um, declined in recent years. Uh, Skeena Chinook, we've got a low expectation as well of two below average co the the NAS and Skeena coho are I've got them at a one to two I, I wasn't quite sure from the input I had but it's but coho has been um, low status up there for many years as has chum so we've got NAS chum at a two and Skeena chum at a one so that I don't think there's a lot of surprises there for anybody that's kind of the the long-term situation Moving to the central coast, um, mainland coastal sockeye, so area seven and eight, there's there's not a lot of information that's available from a lot of these populations. Uh, so some of them are, are data deficient, others they've, they've classified as either a one or a two. Generally, uh, they're considered depressed stocks. Similar in the rivers Smith sockeye area, um, rivers uh, inlet area, which includes two CUs, uh, expectations are below average, and Smith is considered data deficient. Uh, moving into pink, Central Coast pink, I've noted man the old management escapement goals here uh, and the average run, and I don't have information for area 9 or 10, but we've got low expectations, if not very low expectations, for many of the Central Coast pink stocks. Central Coast Chinook, a little bit more variable, so again, uh, limited assessment information. There is the at narco indicator stock, uh, low expectations for there, similar to other northern Chinook stocks. Maybe a little bit of more positive situation in some for some in, for some of the areas seven and eight Chinook stocks, but a lot of data deficiency there, and the same kind of story for areas nine and ten. Uh, Co Central Coast Coho. Uh, again, there's a lot of data deficiency in this area. I haven't noted it, but the expectations are generally, generally low for Central Coast Coho in areas five and six and seven to 10. And then for Chum, uh, not much better, unfortunately, other than perhaps area eight, there's some, a near average expectation here. There's a little note here I put here from the biologist. Uh, um, so there's a little bit more optimism, I think, where they've got some enhancement. but. But, but mostly low to, very low to um, below average expectations and, a, and some, a lot of uncertainty with data limitations. 
Okay, I'm going to move down to South Coast and start with uh, West Coast Vancouver Island area. In the Barclay system, uh, oh, this is a, one of the, the better stories. We've got average expectation for the SOMAS aggregate. So the average return there is 750. This three here is probably, we're not, I don't think we're expecting 750, probably closer to five to 600,000 Chinook. And note for those of you that fish in this area, there's been some problems over the recent years where Great Central uh, was lower status than Sprout Lake. So there had to be some adjustment to the harvest plan to accommodate that. And uh, that seems to be remedied at least in the upcoming year. So that's positive. Um, and Henderson Lake uh, is a two. So not expected to be, um, at, well, most of you who fish there will know that we, we manage that fishery to avoid Henderson um, sockeye regardless, because it generally has been low status in recent years. There's a number of other CUs on the West Coast Vancouver Island, these small, well, some of them used to not be so small like Kennedy Lake, um, but most of these are, are data deficient. Generally, we assume that they're co-varying with these stocks, but, uh, or with, you know, um, some of them have been more abundant in recent years, but we really don't have a lot of information on these. So they're data deficient. West Coast Vancouver Island Chinook. So here we've broken it down into the wild component where we've got three CUs that contribute to the wild component. But of course we have a lot of hatcheries in West Coast Vancouver Island and it's, and for the wild component CUs um, or, and populations are associated with those, the outlook as it has been for many years is one, this is a stock of concern and we manage fisheries to avoid West Coast Chinook. People who fish in the Northern BC fisheries will be aware of exploitation rate limits. So the management target is a 10 to 15% um, exploitation rating in some of the key Canadian um, fisheries such as Northern Troll uh, and Northern a the, the Northern AEBM generally. Uh, so uh, they remain at a one, uh, but the terminal hatchery returns, uh, in contrast, we expect average abundances in there. So there should be some fishable returns for all areas. Uh, we've added a lower row here too, because uh, these are your big hatcheries, but we've also got systems that uh, are essentially um, hatchery systems, such as the Berman and Cerrito River. We're working on developing uh, reference points and benchmarks for the, those and in, in, in the overall rebuilding plan that's being developed. But like other hatchery systems, they're expected to be uh, you know, near average, but in contrast to the wild component. Okay, West Coast Vancouver Island chum. Uh, chum returns have been fairly low in recent years, uh, maybe a little bit of uptake in some of the more northern areas, but um, for the most part, uh, you know, low to maybe near average returns for West Coast Vancouver Island chum. Um, that hatchery, just note here, it's it's forecast to be near average. So that's a, you know, should be a, maybe a bit of an improvement in some cases from recent years. Okay, oops, um, sorry, flipping around here. Uh, West Coast Vancouver Island Coho, um, uh, somewhat data limited, uh, not much exploitation on these, these fish relative to historic. Uh, the, the spawning abundance is expected to be near average. And West Coast Pink, it's just noted here, this stock collapsed in the 1960s. Uh, since then, you know, there's been, we just opportunistically survey it when we observe, observe fish in other surveys. Um, anyway, it's data deficient. It's not, there, there's not a fishable uh, stock here anyway. I'm going to move on to the East Coast Vancouver Island, mainland inlet, sockeye and pink. So we've broken it down by Nimkish, uh, Sackinaw, and some of the other areas with a bit of uh, where we've got some index information. So again, low expectations for for these populations, very low for Sackinaw, which is, in, I mean, that's, as you know, has been a stock of concern for many years. Uh, if we move into pink, there's uh, very low expectations for um, areas 11 to 13. In contrast, in the sort of Georgia, uh, he's in the southern portion of the East Coast Vancouver Island, um, more average expectations. Moving on to East Coast Vancouver Island Chinook, uh, the mainland inlet area is data deficient. I already talked about the, the recent Southgate slide as being, you know, an example of where we, we don't have information, you know, we know there's fish in there, but we don't have information to 
uh, look at trends. Uh, upper serrated Georgia, middle serrated Georgia, near average returns expected, the lower serrated Georgia uh, below average. Um, and then there's a the, there's the spring and summer populations are also expected to be below average. Moving on to CHUM, in the um, East Coast Vancouver Island, Island and Mainland Inlets, we've broken it down into areas 11 to 13, a below average expectation. And then uh, Peter has broken down uh, specific areas here that are fished and in the sort of terminal fisheries. And again, uh, the expectations are below average for 2021. And then for coho, similarly for the state of Georgia, uh, the outlook is a two, so below average. Okay, I'm going to move on to Fraser Sakai now. And there's quite a lot of information provided for Fraser Sakai because it's a data uh, driven, data rich aggregate of populations. Uh, the early stewards are an outlook category one, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Then we'll move on to the early summers. Uh, some variation here. So we, I've got it broken down by the lower Fraser. And actually, this is what the um, Fraser staff provided. So we've got it aggregated within this early summer management unit to the lower Fraser area, South Thompson, the middle and upper Fraser. And it just, yeah, this is the summer run. OK, so early summers, uh, yeah, you'll see some variation here. So I've got average return for all cycles noted. And uh, there are issues around these benchmarks, especially when they're cyclical populations. So, uh, and, the, and the frizzy process, as I understand, is about to um, embark again. Uh, management targets for Fraser, Sakai, as you know, are determined through the Fraser panel process and they're defined at the aggregate. So I haven't noted them here. Um, we've noted the COSIWIC status. I should note, I need to update some of the COSIWIC status information that I'm presenting because there was a revised, um, document that was that was just uh, circulated a couple days ago so that's one of the revisions i want to make before i finalize a preliminary outlook but in any case here we're we're um we've got uh, expectations from you know very below average all the way to average in the early summers which is going to be a challenge for management i assume uh, in the outlook document you'll notice in the comments and stuff there's more information about which which uh, stocks and, and groups are affected by the big bar um, minus slide two. So the summer run is kind of a similar situation. We're ranging from critical kind of levels for some of these populations, including some of the historically big contributors to uh, near average expectations for some stocks. So one to three and similar situation for the late run. Although some of this isn't new information, at least for cultists and so on. So just, yeah, so you've got the document. You can review this in detail with the comments. And then Fraser Pink, the outlook is below average as well for the lower Fraser CU. I'm going to move into Fraser Chinook stream type. Uh, so I just, I grouped, initially I grouped this into the, the stream type Chinook. So that's Fraser, Fraser Spring 4-2s, 5-2s, Summer 5-2s. They all refer, they are all a, a, a category one as well. So below average or well below average um, and continued low abundance expected for these uh, stock management units. Fraser ocean type, this is one of the bright lights in the outlook. We're still expecting abundant returns for the for the Shushua populations and South Thompson. Uh, and then the one, the the Category one here is the Maria Slough, which is part of this aggregate. Ocean type fall. Uh, so you've got your aggregate return, and then the the uh, the um, this is be the Chilliwack River, and this is the Harrison. Oops, actually, sorry. I think this should actually be a two, um, but we've got a we've got a uh, hatchery um, uh, the the uh, the Harrison or sorry the Chilliwack's expected to be at abundant status. The uh, lower Fraser, this it was categorized as a one. As I mentioned, I really think this should probably be a two. Uh, th there is a lower, like F, uh, lower biological benchmark in place for that CU. Um, recent escapements have been around forty thousand to fifty thousand average, so below the management target um, for sure, but uh, not necessarily at that that level. And and this is you know one of the reasons for going over like you know how we 
how we use references, how we classify references, um, it's important because we're trying to improve the, the standardization of that. So like I said, I, I think in the document I've changed that to it too. Either way, there's there's still uh, um, there's still management measures that are taken into account either under the because you're in the cautious zone or because you've got uh, PST requirements potentially for some of these PST managed stocks. Fraser Coho, um, low, well below average expectations. They're all classified at a, at, as a one this year again. And Fraser Chum, similar to some of the East Coast Vancouver Island uh, units, uh, below average expectations. Uh, Okanagan Sakai, I'm still waiting for. Okanagan Chinook, the outlook is a one. That's not a surprise. It's considered an endangered stock by Kosiwik. Um, I've got a few placeholders in the document for we've broken out Burrard Inlet and, and Boundary Bay area. I didn't put those in there because I'm still waiting for information. They, they may be more data deficient, but uh, trying to be um, inclusive of, of those areas as well. So in summary, the overall expectations for salmon returns are generally, generally low and similar to 2020. There's the exceptions we noted. So there's the Fraser Chinook summer four ones are expected to be abundant. We've got some average to near average returns expected for a few Fraser stocks. I, I underlined a few because you saw the problem there where you've got management units with, with uh, categories from you know critical kind of levels of abundance all the way up to average. Um, and then you know we've got average returns expected for the SOMAS Sakai um, system. Well, let's say near average returns. Don't expect I, at this point I wouldn't be expecting. Um, uh, above average, but you know, you're approaching average there. Taku Sakai, Enhanced Wild, West Coast Van Corrales Chinook, and some of the other Chum and, and Chinook systems we noted. Uh, just flagging that there's still concerns for interior Fraser conservation units that are natively impacted by the big bar landslide overlaid on top of this. And I got, I think, one final slide. Oh, a couple. So uh, next steps with, a, with, this, with this document and process. So I've got some additional work required to finalize that draft Outlook document, the PDF we sent around today. So I've, I've got to update and add some of the recent COSIWIC assessments. There's some additional info I want to add. I need to verify a few sections of, and uh, add a table of contributors. So you know, you know who to contact for further information. Um, and starting the new year, uh, stock forecast will be completed, so we'll compile these into the version two of this document early April. Um, so that, so like, just so there's no confusion, I've got a draft here which I want to update in the next few weeks. The version two with the forecast will be in April. Uh, we'll continue to document stock references, stock trajectories, etc. Uh, this is at least part of our work that we need to do to get better um, prepared for implementing the Fishery Act. And over the next few months, um, we're, we're doing work to update um, conservation unit and stock management unit maps. Uh, a lot of this work is near complete, so we're going to add maps to the document. And the idea is to make uh, these maps and the associated data, including the stock trajectories, um, accessible through uh, a government open data portal. So hopefully by um, you know the time we're into the version two of this document, that will be in this position. This work is going on as we speak. Uh, and I just, this is the type of information that we're compiling. So for each stock management unit where we have information uh, for reference, I just I just gave a Barclay Sakai example. I didn't have time to complete all this for this version. I might get there over the next couple of um, weeks, depending on, on other um, work that I got to get done. But I want this information to be available at this type of level of information to be available where we have it. So what are the returns at the aggregate levels? Um, what's the exploitation rate patterns? Uh, when we have references defined and spawner uh, uh, trajectories, where are they in relation to the, the, the benchmarks that are in place? And again, this is, this is an effort at improved transparency and access to data to help you with your conversations and planning and, and work that you do, not just you know with us, but um, in your own kind of um, considerations as well. So, yeah, that's that's all I had to say. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. I uh, I think I can speak for a lot of us in uh, expressing appreciation for the uh, the size of this undertaking, the amount of work that's uh, gone into uh, revamping and updating the outlook. So, definitely express my appreciation for the work you've uh, done in terms of coordinating that work. Uh, to provide the info. 
I did see in the chat a couple of questions about the, the PDF that was referred to. So this morning we did uh, circulate by email uh, a PDF document that has uh, more detailed commentary on the Outlook. So uh, if you didn't receive that, uh, check your email for starters. But if you still don't have it, you could uh, send an email to G Lee with DFO and her email is in the chat if you just uh, go through and have a look uh, for it there and we can get you a copy of it. Um, so with that, I'm going to go to the uh, list of uh, people with hands up, uh, the participants list here. And so first on my list, I'm uh, showing, showing Jeremy Maynard. Go ahead, Jeremy. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, thank you, Diane, for uh, your presentation. Very informative as always. Um, I was just uh, a bit surprised at the uh, low, lower status number assigned to um, LGS Chinook or primarily couch, and I think it was a two. It was about slide 28 or thereabouts. And I guess, you know, maybe that's true if you include all of the, you know, smaller systems like the Shimanus, but for the couch and as the indicator, uh, you know, considering it's exceeded its uh, spawning escapement target for the last five years in a row, um, a number two seemed a bit a bit low. So just just a point. Um, maybe that could be reconsidered. Uh, I'm just is is uh, someone from South Coast on the call? Will, are you still on the call? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure where the two came from either. I agree with Jeremy that it was, uh, unless Kevin's on, other than Nanaimo's kind of is still below long-term average, but uh, overall our indicator is well above average. Yes, if, if, if you read the comments, um, so if you focus on the couch and River and if you read the actual comments, the 2021 outlook is for average to above average returns. So that would be even a three for sure. So I'm not yeah. sure where it came from, but yeah, but we can change that. OK, thanks. Uh, it, it may be, like Will said, um, the fact that it's moderated by the Nanaimo River, and that's the secondary comment in the document. But again, what, what might be useful here is I break it out into the couch and, and then break, break a separate line out for the Nanaimo so that it's more clear. Thank you. I'm on mute. Sorry, I'm on mute. Uh, next up, I've got uh, Marilyn. Hi, thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you, Diana. Um, I had a question that was similar to Jeremy's, but is, is it is it fair distinction to say that um, the ocean type Chinook are generally doing better uh, in southern British Columbia than the stream type Chinook? I mean, we saw some fours on some ocean types there. And um, and if that is the case, I mean, maybe there's some anomalies. Is the Nanaimo River um, an ocean or a stream type Chinook? I'm just trying to see what, where, the, where the trends are. Uh, okay, so I can answer the first part of the question. I think it is fair to say that ocean type, like it, it, particularly in the Fraser with maybe the exception of Harrison, uh, uh, ocean type Chinook, for example, it's a stream type Chinook that we're really worried about. Uh, and yeah, we will see, although, there is still this trend where in some of the northern stocks, right, the Chinook has gone down as well, the Chinook populations. Uh, well, if again, what are the Nanaimo? Are they, they're diff aren't they a little bit more variable age class? Or no? Uh, it's a summer run as well. It's, and they're uh, closely listed them as uh, endangered. So, so, we're, we're, yeah, we're so you would have a bit of a life history variation there. Okay, so and then just a, a follow up question then. So would stream type Chinook um, who were, may, may have more of a local distribution and spend more time in the estuaries be more vulnerable to the predatory issues around you know, sea lions and um, seals? Uh, stream type Chinook are offshore migrators. So they're, they're, they, they're, they're, they don't, they're, they're thought to rear off the off, off, way off Vancouver Island. They're not, I, I'm not sure if that would be true, Marilyn. Um, someone from the Fraser could better um, say that, but they do spend they do spend that extra year in fresh water. So those of you that have seen Richard Bailey's presentation, say in the Southern BC Chinook process, where he's gone into detail about what the impacts have been on in freshwater habitat, Sue had part of that in her presentation. So so any kind of any uh, stream marine population that spends more time in that kind of environment will be affected by that more than an ocean type 
um, fish would be that that leaves that environment more rapidly. Thank you. Uh, Todd Matthew, you're next. Yeah, earlier uh, um, it was mentioned that harvest control rules are at the aggregate level um, for various purposes. Um, but I guess, you know, what's what's of interest is how those harvest uh, control rules impact, you know, conservation units, um, you know, over time, I guess. And, and just to, is there a way of uh, displaying that or assessing that so we can actually see if if those harvest control rules are actually working for one CU or versus another, um, you know, that the reason I'm saying that is that, you know, in, in some of the aggregates, uh, perhaps, you know, if there's 10 CU in an aggregate, three or four or five of them might be relatively large. And, and, uh, and so, you know the the harvest control rule might might be might affect them, um, you know, versus others, and maybe so. I, I guess that's what I'm getting at. And I guess, you know, unless you understand the impact on the CUs, you know, of the harvest control rule, um, you know, you you won't be able to make changes. And in, in other words, if if you know, if many of the many of the CUs, the smaller CUs, like what what I'm interested in, are 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 not reacting. Uh, and either either declining or staying the same at a low level, then maybe the harvest control rule for the aggregate needs to be changed. Thanks. Yeah, so that's a really good question, Pat. So that's why I flipped back to this slide. So we have to put like at the aggregate stock management unit level, and we aggregated for practical reasons, we're going to have to have a limit reference point in place. Now that limit reference point would be the point at which you're, you know, you're, you're surveilling, you're uh, surveilling, you know, you're pre presumably curtailing fisheries, you know, to a large extent uh, under the Fishery Act. Uh, there's a bit of a loophole there around if there's other types of factors like habitat that are, um, that are, that are driving that population down. We don't quite know how to interpret that yet. But what we're working on is, is uh, how do we define LRPs that take into account the CU level biodiversity? And that's exactly, that question that you asked is exactly what we're, we're grappling with. In fact, um, Carrie Holt, she's one of our research scientists, she's leading a, a project right now to try to come to terms with that. And so you're right, we will need CU level information to demonstrate that we, you know, if we've come up with an LRP, a limit reference point for an aggregate group of CUs, that that limit reference point and the associated harvest control rules are adequately accommodating the biodiversity that's associated with that aggregate. So it is a very good question. It's the point the the issue I was pointing out with Fraser Sockeye, where you know you've got management units, uh, where you've got um, status varying from like very very critical low levels all the way up to like near average levels. And so yeah, is your harvest control rule sufficiently precautionary to accommodate that biodiversity? And is your limit reference point adequately taking into account that? And there's a number of ways we can get to that and get the information that would justify the use, say, of an aggregate LRP. Um, but we do have to do that work. And we're and we're grappling with that right now. And we don't know all the solutions. And we're, uh, like I said, Carrie's leading a, a, a working group to um, develop a CSAS process to, and paper to, to provide some um, recommendations in this regard. Maybe just to add to that, Diana, you are in the outlook where you've got the data. You did show us the slide for uh, Barkley Sockeye that has the aggregate data, but then also the the CU specific information with the benchmark. So I think uh, you're indicating the intent is uh, where you have that information to actually report it here in the outlook over time. Yeah, and for sure, because you because, and that's and then so adding this level of um, um, de-aggregate information was deliberate on our part. So we we flagged those things that you're talking about, um, Pat. The other piece is the stock trajectory information where we have CU level information. I'll try to um, provide that in, in some cases we won't have that. It's a little bit complicated. Uh, the initial guidance 
from Ottawa was that for each, so this, so Barclay Sockeye is one stock management unit under the Fishery Act, and the, the kind of direction was we have to have one lower reference point. We're not sure why that, you know, would happen when you've got this kind of level of information, but you, but the question would be at what point and, and at what scale you sort of derive or, or develop rebuilding plans. And it's not just your lower reference point, it's also your harvest control rule. Because in some of these mixed stock fisheries, um, most of you will be aware that in this case, uh, even though Henderson Lake is generally considered a depressed CU, we take a we don't harvest. We've got a we've got additional management rules and time area closures to limit the harvest on that stock. So it's not just a function of what your reference points are; it's also a function of what your, your harvest strategy looks like in its entirety, including the decision rules. And so that will require better documentation in some cases of what those decisions are. There's other examples around the coast, uh, transboundary stocks where they have aggregate kind of management and sort of similar in season assessment processes to Barclay. They would do the same type of thing where they've, they've got conservation units for which they're concerned about. They restrict fishery access during those periods. So yeah, the, the point is you're developing a defensible and responsive and adaptive management, harvest management response to your status information. Can I just have a quick follow up? Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, that's 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 good to hear. Um, I guess the other part you mentioned was habitat, you know, um, you know, possibly driving it down. I, I what you know, what process is it that we would look at whether it's harvest or habitat? I mean, is that the uh, is that the species at risk process or is it the uh, the uh, rebuilding regulatory rebuilding process. I, I guess that's, you know, that's of interest to us. Is what, you know, what process do we use to get at that? And you know, for us in in the interior in the Thompson, you know, if there are habitat issues, you know, limiting survival, we want to we want to get at finding out, you know, what those are and 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 start addressing them in in our area. So. Yeah. So that's another really good question, Pat. And again, we are, and Jeff might have a follow up for me too. So under the Fishery Act, we have an obligation. I'm going to throw up, let me see if I, I have another slide here. I'm just going to, um, just bear with me for one second. I want to share a different screen. Um, share. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, so this is this is a I just saw this graph or this diagram yesterday, but under the Fishery Act, uh, so here's the same kind of schematic, right? Where you've got a stock that's considered critical, you've got a stock that's in the cautious zone, and you've got a stock that's healthy. So, so section six. And I maybe make that presentation mode so it's a bit bigger for people to see it. Okay, then I'm going to have to just bear with me. I'm going to have to find that. Oops, um, I'm going to have to. Zoom to the oh okay so you can see it now right? Yeah, this is better. Well, it's better. It's in presenter mode, so we can see your next slide sitting on there. But that's okay. How do I get rid of that? I shouldn't be. Oh, because I'm in the wrong. Um. Uh, that's okay. I... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Uh. So anyway, in I I'm looking at a bigger version of this, but basically, uh, under the Fishery Act. So the idea is. You know, if the stock is declining, you go below your LRP and there's a whole bunch of questions about when, you know, is it three years when you're below your LRP in the guidance, but you would develop a rebuilding plan. Uh, and then that, and then once you're out of the rebuilding plan, you're kind of in your regular harvest management. With poor salmon, what we're arguing both nationally and regionally is that a rebuilding plan isn't, can't just be about, uh, you know, what your harvest response is. And because there's, we know there's so many factors that affect salmon, and this is what I mentioned earlier, we want to get to HHHE, like harvest, hatchery, habitat, ecosystem type management perspective. So if it's, and, and we want to have a rebuilding plan that accommodates um, uh, building a common understanding of the cause of de decline from all those perspectives and then identifying strategies across that spectrum. And so that's where we want to get to, Pat and others. Uh, there is this question, and it's a fair question about, about you asked, well, where does Sarah fit into here? And so under Sarah, we've developed recovery plans uh, through the years, but the recovery plan, you know, Sarah's about, 
about really about this part of the spectrum. It's not about the overall management. The, the, the Fishery Act is broader, right? Ultimately, and the wild sound policy is broader. Obviously, you're trying to get to an integrated um, place where you've got a robust management plan in place across the spectrum of abundance. And so there is there are questions about what the role of recovery planning is and how we how we um, uh, deal with our CERO requirements versus our Fishery Act requirements. And it, they're important questions because, uh, you know, when we don't list a stock, then we often develop a recovery plan, but we don't want to be doing these things twice. We want to be doing these things once. We want to make sure that the rebuilding plans are fulsome with regard to salmon in, in all of these elements I talked about. So I don't quite know the answer to your question, Pat, other than it's a sort of a national discussion in terms of implementation of the Fishery Act and you know how we go about strategically in dealing with this, these issues and also flagging that you know it can't just be about um, the same old status quo in, in terms of pointing to you know harvest management actions as opposed to the broader spectrum of strategies we would take to manage and rebuild salmon for those stocks that are depressed. So we're, we're trying to sort this out in policy guidance and discussions right now, but it's very active in terms of um, uh, of you know what this all means. I don't have all the answers. Okay, thanks, Diana. Um, Sid Quinn, we got you next. Uh, thanks, Diana. My my question is around uh, the Jervis Inlet Chum, and you know, so I think it's slide twenty seven. Let me just go there. Oh, there. Um, just bear with me. Slide 27. Yeah. And um, my question is around like we're we're part of the mainland inlets, but we're we're in the conservation unit with the east coast of Vancouver Island with an IMO couch and Goldstream. And we've seen such a devastating uh uh, decline in chum returns, and it's it's more similar to the to the Oak Over, Theodosia, and and Lang Creek, and the northern mainland inlets where we've seen such a decline. I'm not sure if it's related to you know the out my I, I think it's related to the out migration as one of the factors or indicators of of the uh, the fish that come out of those systems are turning and heading up. The inside waters versus these other facilities that possibly are, are going out the west coast. I, I, I don't know if there's been research done like that, but you know, again, uh, I know there's been management adjustments uh, over the past couple of years now based on these low returns that we're experiencing. Um, is there uh, well, so, uh, is there someone from South Coast that has more comments on the on what's going on here? Don't okay. They're not on the call. Yeah, I don't. I I I don't. I'm not. I you. I would. You would need to refer to probably Peter Van Will um, to provide more of that kind of information. I don't know if they've looked at that specifically. Yeah, Sid Wilfair. Yeah, I agree with you. It's it's an issue we got to try to figure. But with chum salmon, I think it gets back to what uh, the blob and the offshore migrants are generally uh, doing really poorly. Um, but for some reason, couch and Goldstream, some Nanaimo's chum are doing okay. And that's what we're, is why are those guys doing okay when generally most of the other chum are doing so poorly? Yeah, and you know, like, and, and we're also being lumped in there, we're at a two and we're probably more at a one in such a uh, drastic decline in, in those populations that, you know, haven't seen, uh, you know, I don't think in their history that, that low. Yeah, there's lots of variation. In this, in that, in that two there, there's lots of really low ones and some not so low ones. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Sid. Uh, Jean Vier. Hello. Uh, hi, Diana. Thank you very much for uh, for all your work on improving the format of the Outlook. It's uh, it's great, and I really look forward to um, the addition of the uh, the stock trajectory. Uh, graphs and table. I think that will greatly improve the transparency of the outlook. But for now, uh, the outlook is is still not 
uh, transparent, and I'm looking specifically at uh, Skina Chinook. Uh, the comments say that um, the you know 2017 and 2020 returns have been record low, and I would add that for Skina Chinook we don't have biological benchmarks. And the last five years return have been well below the 25th percentile. So I think a category two is is quite generous for 2021. Okay, well that that um, that might be something we need to change because uh, th that came in late, and I'm not sure Ivan actually categorized it. So that that's something that I might have to change. So thanks for pointing that out. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, John Vier. Uh, I'm not seeing any other uh, hands up on my list. Are there any other questions? Just double checking uh, with G or others. Is there? Oh, Urs Thomas, go ahead, Urs. Okay, thanks, Jeff. I'm just wondering. In 2017, we had that huge impact of juvenile black cod uh, on the North Coast. Is that impact considered in the forecast as well? Uh, and I wouldn't think so, like not to my knowledge. I, I, re I, remember, I remember that event for sure, but that would be unlikely to be considered in any of this. Okay, thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, Mike Forrest. Thank you. Uh, Diana, what a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question has to do with stock assessment. Uh, I guess we're all concerned about not having enough stock assessment and certainly the number of places where we're data deficient. But in stock assessment, are the standards for the inspection and the reporting in stock assessment, are there standards and are we keeping up a, a, so that everybody is reporting in the same format and we can rely on what we're seeing for stock assessment? Uh, no, there, well, there, in some cases we are, in some cases we're not. So uh, there is some improvement to be done there. So, and keep in mind that um, that's a complicated question because we're going to have, in some cases we'll have what we would call more data driven or data intensive type of uh, monitoring programs. So an example would, I'm going to use examples that I've worked on over the years. So an example would be a code and wire indicator stock and the kind of video monitoring, you know, an intensive sampling that we would do in a place like Robertson Creek in the Stamp Falls program, say on the West Coast Vancouver Island or any other uh, Chinook code and wire tag indicator stock. So the standards for those types of assessment or monitoring programs are higher in terms of the sampling rates we're trying to achieve, the precision and the information we're trying to achieve, for the spawner estimates and so on versus say more data limited systems where it might be visual counts that are being reported through contract crews or, or partners like First Nations. Um, but even so, so you're going to have sort of more data limited to more data driven assessment approaches and that's perfectly valid because if you think about it, it's an allocation issue like we don't you know, we, we will drive more money towards systems that we tend to be exploiting more at a higher levels like the sockeye populations, for example, or in some cases, Chinook populations, we also might drive more monitoring money towards populations where we're trying to figure out what's going on if they're lower status, uh, where we may have where we have lower exploitation or we have less concerns then we may in fact use more data limited approaches that so so there's so you'll have a spectrum of monitoring from data limited to more data driven which is perfectly defensible so long as your your management responses kind of reflect that level of uncertainty in your data. So example would be the way we manage CHUM. We have less certain CHUM spawner information and recruit information, so we tend to manage those fisheries uh, you know, with, with low harvest rates. So that's the first part of the question. But then the second thing is, even if you are in fact um, co collecting data in any of that spectrum, you know, are we getting the information that we need in order to be able to use it? So the, the appropriate metadata, um, a stream inspection log has been submitted that we can, we know, you know, when the crew was in there and we can be confident that the observations that they report are actually um, reflecting the correct species and so on. There is some work to do around improving standards um, in terms of that work, particularly when we're dealing with um, partners. 
Uh, in some cases, there, some cases it, it, we're already there. In other cases, we could be improving it. And so that is on our um, radar in terms of standards and guidance. And part of the, the motive for that is so that we can better use data that may be collected through citizen groups and citizen science and so on. So I hope that answers your question. Well, that was exactly the point. The cross-section of people inter interested in being part of uh, stock reporting, stock assessment is encouraging. Uh, but I'd like it all. I, I hope that in time we can get to a, an assessment standard so that the, the data can be more meaningful and helpful in our management. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. OK, I'm going to give the last question to Greg Knox and then uh, just do a quick wrap up. Uh... Go ahead, Greg. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And thanks, Diana. It's a really great presentation. And um, I just one thing you you emphasized is on the recovery side of things that the focus is on uh, harvest habitat and hatcheries, uh, considering the the scientific overwhelming scientific evidence showing the impacts of hatcheries on wild salmon and now the uh, over over capacity or the la lack of food in the north pacific and us you know 40 percent of the salmon going into the ocean are from these hatcheries um i'm just wondering does, does that third h mean the department wants to put in more hatchery production or are you actually going to protect wild salmon by reducing the impacts from hatcheries um, oh, in recovery planning. Yeah, so that's, a, I, again, I think that's a, it requires a complicated response. So I think um, the, the way I view it, so if we're trying to get into H, 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 and I call it H, 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 E, right? Because it's not just habitat, it could be other ecosystem impacts. Somebody mentioned invasive species, predators have been mentioned. My view is, I'm just gonna scroll up. Like, so we, we have clear, um, you know, under what's emerging under the Fisheries Act, right, is is clear obligations around de development of the precautionary approach, right? It's not just policy anymore. It's by regulation. Managers will, will and and science with science supporting them will be expected to have, you know, these references in place. You'll be familiar with the the hatchery reform in the U.S. where hatcheries. Uh, have specific targets and and monitoring programs and one of one of the objectives of hatchery reform is to limit impacts on wild stocks, and so we can do that in a number of ways. Part of it's going to require better monitoring of the uh, the PNI, so the proportion of the natural um, spawners in hatchery influence systems, and so we will, I think we need to get there, uh, and we are making some moves to get there, uh, and. So, so PNI type management, um, more explicit hatch, hatchery objectives, so that you that you are monitoring and trying to understand your impacts in wild stocks. And that bigger question of like, and somebody asked, I think during Sue's presentation about the carrying capacity issue with the North Pacific. I mean, that is like Sue said, a complicated like um, a complicated issue right now. But presumably, that would be kind of one layer you might be thinking about too. But but for but I think in this sort of like moving towards more strategic management and more integrated management, your hatchery management, and even if you are using hatcheries, in some cases we'll use hatcheries to try to rebuild a stock. And I think that's legitimate, but what we'd be wanting to move towards is improved management and assessment of that, those those hatchery interventions and explicit objectives and performance management. So that that's where I like to see us go. And what that will require is you know, just like we develop an IFMP, like an integrated fisheries management plan, and I think under the C68, I'd, I'd argue we need to go into a lot more detail. And Pat Matthews already, already kind of alluded to that with, you know, how are we going to take into account sea level diversity? So I think we're going to have to do a lot more articulation. In some cases, we've got harvest strategies that are well articulated. In other cases, we need to do a lot more work. But I think there should be something analogous for hat tree management. Um, that allows us to better articulate the science behind how we're assessing hatchery impacts and how we're setting objectives and so on, and how we're monitoring the performance of those and including the impacts on wild stocks. And finally, you know, how you manage impacts on wild stocks, it, it's not just through monitoring or perhaps reducing production, it also could be through removals. So uh, one of the objectives of, for some, you know, of a, of a mark selective fishery, for example, could be to, you know, reduce PNI in a terminal fishery. On, on, a, on potential stocks for hatchery fish may stray into. 
Yeah, but the challenge is we were we were supposed to come up with hatchery risk assessment tool that looked at all the aspects of hatchery impacts on wild salmon under the wild salmon policy. That was, you know, 15 years ago. We still haven't really done it. There's a, a very poor risk assessment tool currently developed by the department. And yet we're moving forward with uh, putting more money into hatchery production without actually understanding the risks to wild salmon. And now we're trying to incorporate it into recovery planning under the new Fisheries Act. So this is uh, extremely concerning. Um, I think it's. I think your points are valid, and I think how we deal with that and and how we identify enhancement strategies and monitor and, and set objectives in rebuilding plans will be an important component. So I, I, I like that. And which is what, why you know when we're talking nationally about a requ what our requirements are under a salmon rebuilding plan, we're we're trying to make the case that it you know it needs to be go into a lot more detail than just simply a harvest response. So yeah, I, I'm I'm not uh, I, I I think you're you're making some valid points. Thank okay, you. thanks, uh, Diana. Maybe just a quick one on that as well. I mean, Canada's hatchery production is. Uh, a relatively small sliver of the total hatchery production going into the North Pacific. Obviously, Russia, Japan, the US and other countries are, are very big producers compared to us. So there is an international dimension to that as well. OK, so uh, I'd like to thank uh, Diana and Sue for their presentations uh, today. Much appreciated uh, you two for the information. In terms of next steps, uh, we will make the PDFs of the presentations available. There's a PDF of the Outlook that's gone out, but if you haven't received it, as we noted, uh, please let G. Lee know, and uh, we'll make sure you get a copy of that. Uh, we'll also have a link of the uh, recording as well.